Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, I hope it's a good evening. Uh, I'm Eckhart Grohl. I'm uh, currently serving as the head of the School of Mechanical Engineering. And it's a distinct honor for me to welcome all of you back uh, to the Purdue campus and to our tonight's Outstanding Mechanical Engineering Awards Banquet. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. It's a very special occasion for us. Uh, it's always one of our favorite events of the year that we're hosting. Uh, so on behalf of the faculty, the staff, and all of our students, undergraduate and graduate alike, uh, it's great to have you back and uh, welcome back to Purdue University. So uh, what is an OME? The Outstanding Mechanical Engineer Award recognizes alumni who have demonstrated excellence in industry, academia, governmental service, or any other endeavor. And as you can read in the program, as we go through the awardees tonight, right, uh, uh, those include a lot of different endeavors. We have alumni who have achieved great things in the business world, in the engineering world, in academia and research, in gov government and national defense, and just about any other area you can think of. Our students often tell us that those that they choose uh, ME because it enables them to do almost anything. And this gathering tonight is a living proof of that. So speaking of which, I want to quickly give you an update about your alma mater, the School of Mechanical Engineering here at Purdue. Uh, you may have already known you were part of an elite group as Purdue graduates, but now, uh, our friends at U.S. News and World Report have somewhat confirmed it. Uh, as, as of this week, just recently announced, uh, the Purdue undergraduate BSME degree is ranked number six in the nation. Uh, so that is... <laughs> that is two spots up from last year. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, we're still five spots too slow, too low. <laughs> so we all know who's really number one, right? Uh, our graduate program is also in the top 10. We have been ranked consistently as number eight, but I would like to point out that we are actually, in fact, uh, number one in one of our programs, and that is our online master's education program. So we are number one for three years running in online education in the US. Um, so that's a great news. <laughs> Would also like to mention to all of you that this year's class, incoming class of undergraduate students is the largest we ever had. We have 1,800, actually to be exact, we are at 1,856 as of the latest poll that I've uh, received from our academic advisor. Uh, undergraduate students coming in, and we are uh, slightly over 1,000 graduate students. Uh, so uh, over 2,800 students total in the School of ME, it's, uh, it's quite an operation. Now of the 1,000 graduate students, 400 is in that said uh, online master's program. So they're not all residential, but it's still uh, a significant program. In addition, we have grown uh, with faculty and staff to educate those students and our total headcount in faculty is currently 94. So we're, we're pushing ahead, uh, pushing almost 100 now. Uh, so that's moving, uh, uh, or the increase is moving ahead quite nicely too. Uh, with all of the faculty, we're doing tremendous amount of research. Uh, so our research expenditure, this is just third party research money that we're raising that comes into the school and then we're spending it on all these graduate students to educate them, is at almost $49 million. Uh, so we're pushing uh, almost 50 million. And uh, 
uh, that will probably, uh, my guess is the way the success rate is on some of our large uh, scale proposals and activities that are going on, uh, that we will be uh, above 50 million in a year from now. So uh, that is certainly uh, also tremendous. With this amount, today we had our ME Advisory Council meeting, and uh, I presented some statistics, but we actually leading the College of Engineering in research expenditure per faculty time equivalent, FTE, uh, above anybody else, including ECE, which has a few more faculty than we, but we're still beating them. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we're really pushing very hard. I, I mentioned the ranking, right? And ranking is, of course, uh, an interesting topic because it's all perception-based. Um, all of the heads of 200 or more ME programs across the nation rank each other. I'm ranking MIT. I give them a zero. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, right? So uh, it's uh, perception-based. Uh, we are at the forefront of really gearing this up. Uh, we are in the news with many exciting stories. I, I can't name them all, but I would like to point out Shulin Ruan, for example, is still in the news right now with the widest paint ever, right? He's actually in the Guinness Book of Record with the widest paint ever as a heat transfer person. Uh, we also uh, have uh, ex uh, really exceptional success with our alumni, and many of them are here tonight, um, that, uh, that are also in the news. Uh, so astronaut Scott Tingle, for example, one of our alumni, uh, got his master's here in 1988, was recently chosen by NASA as one of the Artemis uh, team, who will be the next humans being uh, to set foot on the moon. So uh, that's uh, very exciting for us. And one, another, uh, one other graduate, Angela Ashmore, I don't know if you heard that name, but she made history this year as the first female crew member to win an Indianapolis 500. She was part of Marcus Erickson's team. So very, very proud of our alumni too. Uh, we are as I mentioned, busting uh, with pride of our, at, the co uh, at the accomplishments of our alumni, but as a school, we are also bursting at the seams as we struggle to find places for all of these residential students to educate. I mentioned over 1,800 undergraduates. Uh, the residential graduate students was over 600. Uh, our original ME building was built in 1929 and meant to hold a handful of basically locomotive engineers, to be honest, right? Boiler makers, that's what we worked on, boilers. Uh, rather than 1,800 undergraduate students who all want to have access to 3D printers nowadays, right? Um, that's why we embarked on a campaign to renovate the entire original ME building. Uh, it's actually made up of four individual sub-buildings um, that were all uh, built in the style, uh, around the 90, late 1920s, early 1930s. Uh, and we want to transform it to the most comprehensive experiential learning environment in the world. Uh, some of you may have heard me, um, I'm pursuing 100% GRID. Not certain if you know what that means, but GRID stands for Global Research Industry and Team Projects and I would like for all of our undergraduate students to have one experience in all four categories. Uh, we, so we look forward to sharing these plans with you. If you have not seen them, there is a brochure in the back. We have printed booklets and floor plans. And our development officers, all of them are here, right? Christina and Scott and Javan, uh, right, would be happy to talk to you to learn more about our projects that we're, uh, that we're conducting. So this will be a major source of excitement for us for the next year. If everything goes as planned, uh, we will be approved by uh, the Board of Trustees with our renovation plans at the December meeting. Uh, and then next year, we're moving actually everybody out over to Swing Space. It will be a Potter as well as Wang Hall. Uh, and then the construction starts uh, potentially as early as next uh, September 
uh, maybe as late as October next year. Uh, but for now, let's talk about tonight's excitement. We have 10 amazing alumni who will be honored tonight. So please enjoy your salads. Uh, and in a minute, uh, our servers will be offering you uh, the dinner following the salads. Uh, Jared Pike, our very, very capable uh, communication specialist in the School of ME, will begin the program of honoring our alumni, uh, the recipients of the 2022 Outstanding Mechanical Engineering Award, uh, right after dinner. And we also, at the end of that award ceremony, have a very special tribute uh, to, to one of our alumni. So uh, hopefully uh, you're all looking forward to this. And once again, I thank all of you for joining us tonight. And we are looking forward to starting the program in roughly about an hour. So enjoy your dinner in the meantime. Thank you very much. All right, while we're waiting for everyone to get back, uh, I do want to share something that happened earlier today. Could you put the photo up about the, uh, the tug of war? Yeah. So uh, earlier this afternoon, we had a tug of war between Emmy and Doubly. Uh, these are the Emmys who won, of course. Uh, yes. You can see in the middle there is Bill Mosley, one of our honorees for the evening. Uh, he wanted to be on the team to pull the rope, but uh, our insurance premiums are just way too high, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, he was cheering from the sidelines. Uh, this apparently was a thing that happened every year between Emmy and Doubly. E. Um, you know, traditions in a school setting, sometimes they, uh, they survive and sometimes they don't. But when we started this one up, the, the students really got into it. They're like, yeah, let's do it. And they came up with all these strategies. This is how we're going to do it. We had uh, two guys from the Caribbean who said that they, were, they did tug of wars from the age of 10. That was just a normal part of their life. So they were coaching everyone. All right, you hold this. You don't need gloves. You do this. You do that. So I mean, those doublies didn't have a chance. But uh, it was such a great time, and, uh, and it was so hot. <laughs> so yes, I took a shower before coming here. But yes, um, our, you can be proud of our Emmy students for winning the tug of war. Who is stronger, mechanical or electrical? Now we know the answer. So um, yes, thank you. I'd like to welcome, you can go ahead now, slide. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's presentation. My name is Jared Pike. I'm the communication specialist for the School of Mechanical Engineering here at Purdue, and we are here tonight to present the Outstanding Mechanical Engineer Awards and pay honor to some of the most accomplished alumni from our school. Now, your program, which I put together, says that there are 18,000 Purdue MEs out there in the world, but I actually checked the numbers uh, this week it is more than 20,000. So that means from the boardrooms to the classrooms, from the factories to the government offices, the world is full of hardworking nerds like you. <laughs> and tonight, <coughs> who said that? Tonight, 10 of you join the ranks of the best of the best, outstanding mechanical engineers. And it's my privilege to introduce our 2022 recipients a bit of logistics of how this is going to work. The awards, as you can see, are very beautiful. They are also very heavy. So we will not be actually handing them, but Eckhart will be standing on the table to present to you. So basically shoving it across the table, you're right. So pause and get your photo taken with Eckhart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll get your chance to carry them home in your carry-on luggage. So, uh, yeah, so pose for a photo with Eckhart and then hopefully come up here and, and share a few words with us about your time at Purdue. So, we start with Robin Brands, who worked at GE for over 32 years on both the technical and the commercial side. 
for military designs and passenger aircraft engines. At one point, every two seconds around the world, an aircraft took off powered by her engines. She recently retired from being the executive chief engineer for the GP7200 engines on the Airbus A380, which was a collaboration between GE Aviation and Pratt and & Whitney. We are thrilled to have her here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, an outstanding mechanical engineer, Robin Brands. So nice to go first because there's really no expectations at this point, right? <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, I think all of you have heard that behind every successful man is an amazing woman. Maybe you haven't heard behind every successful woman is a lot of red wine and dark chocolate. I can, <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> No, but, but seriously, you know, behind no man or woman or woman is an island. Um, and behind every single successful person is a, a village or a tribe. Um, I was fortunate enough to have my mom who is here today because my husband's golfing with his buddies. That was set a long time ago. It is no reflection on our relationship. Um, I was fortunate enough to have my mom who is um, incredibly bright and um, has a lot of grit, um, has persevered a lot. She had a lot to endure. She graduated high school at 16 and had to go straight to work. Um, she didn't have the opportunity to have a college education, but from a very young age, she taught me that I could do whatever I wanted and that you know, there were no limits. Um, but I can say there are lots of people in my life and probably in all of yours that you know supported you no matter what and when you thought it was too difficult or you couldn't do it would, can, would show you that you've done this before and you can do this again. Um, but there are also a lot of people in my life and probably in yours that you don't even know that the difference that they made in your life. Um, they may have behind the scenes helped you like give somebody a recommendation or something that gave you a chance that you didn't even know you had. Um, and one of the things I tell every single person that I mentor and that I want to make sure, even though it seems so obvious once you hear it that you think about it, is words matter. And anything that you say can either lift a person up and help them achieve their dream or scare them away from it. And I don't want to be a person that says something that keeps somebody from doing something that is their dream and that they absolutely can do. I want to be the person that gives them that little tiny bit of an encouragement that makes them accomplish their dream. And that's one of the things I loved about the mechanical engineering group at Purdue. Um, I started out in chemical engineering. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and one, <laughs> I, I had two experiences that helped me change. One was I happened to get uh, a scholarship and an internship for General Motors, and I worked in a group that had Chemis and Emmys, and I realized right away that the Emmys jobs was way cooler. <laughs> but the other thing was, at, when I was in Chemi, and it was a long time ago, and I'm sure everything's changed, and they're wonderful people, um, but it was very competitive, and, and when I went to ask somebody for help if I didn't understand something, they would, some of them would actually try to mislead me because they felt like if they got, they were mostly pre-meds at the time, and if they got a better grade, then it was, if you did bad, they did good. Um, and that was never the environment I wanted to be in because the challenges that we have in today's world are so difficult, and you need everybody rowing in the same direction, and you need to help each other out. So the one thing I would say is, and I tell everybody I mentor is, you know, even if you may not think somebody has the capability, if that's their dream, Find a way to help them and encourage them because you really don't know um, what they can achieve. And you know, Purdue allowed me to do that, and I have so many experiences and so many memories that are all because of the foundation that Purdue laid for me. And um, the fact that I'm getting this, I feel like it's really for my whole team <laughs> because it does. It takes a village, truly. So thank you. <laughs> Next up is Mark Bruker. 
Mark has worked in the energy sector his whole career and has cemented his reputation as the go-to guy for large national corporations looking to reduce utility costs and improve their environmental footprint. He got his master's here at Purdue in 1997, working at Herrick Labs with Dr. Jim Braun. Now he works as a managing partner with Burton Energy Group, which has grown to annual revenues of more than $15 million. He's an outstanding mechanical engineer, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Bruker. Wow, what an honor, really, to, to, to read about the rest of the recipients and to think that I was worthy of this, uh, really something. Thank you, Jim, for, for nominating me. And as I reflect on this award, I think about the blessings that, that I've received that have put me in a position to win it. And it started with my parents. Uh, they're here to, to celebrate with me. Um, Steve and Louise Bruker uh, taught me hard work uh, integrity, um, caring for people, you know, since I was a kid. And, and my dad actually gave me one of the best quotes that I still use today. Uh, he was a production manager at, at Gerber's, so I got to work in the industrial environment. And, and in his office, he had a quote that said, there comes a time in the life of every project when it's time to shoot all the engineers and start production. <laughs> helps me uh, move off of that analysis paralysis and get moving, so wonderful. So, uh, so family is really the, that bedrock of blessing that I've received, my wife Jackie. Uh, while I've been fortunate to, to go build my career and serve national clients and you know, bring people up through our company, she has handled everything in our family and I've been given the blessing of a great coach, a great mentor, a great cheerleader, and someone who just lets me focus on making things happen. And that, that's truly such a blessing. I love you. Thank you for that. Um, I was also blessed very early in, I was a sophomore at, at uh, University of Michigan in mechanical engineering and um, in thermodynamics class, maybe like ME200 that, that Jim teaches. And it just became apparent to me that I was going to work in energy. Just just came down and uh, what a blessing to be able to focus your whole career knowing what you want to do um, and find that. And so I worked for a few years, got accepted at Purdue, it was the best school. I wanted to come back, I loved engineering and, uh, and get my graduate degree. So started working with Jim at the Herrick Lab teams. Eckhart was just an associate professor a couple of years, yeah, maybe a year or two in and uh, had a great group of people. Todd Rossi was uh, kind of my mentor, the PhD student that came before me and developed some great friendships. And that problem solving capability and the environment of practical yet really tough problems that we solve together really helped build a, a great foundation. So what a blessing Purdue has been for me. And, and really a lot of the people have been great connections uh, to end up where I was. Um, and, and that led me to Burton Energy Group. Um, been a partner there for, for 14 years. Um, met Brent, and who has brought me on. I was a second employee as a, as a managing partner and took care of all of the, the business things and the company culture things so I could just focus on the things that I loved. Solving hard problems for, for large clients, uh, helping grow the company. He taught me a lot about clients and humor and relationships and different things, just, just a lot of fun. So he's been a, a huge blessing to me as, as part of that. So um, the team that we've brought in to Burton, a lot of great engineers from Georgia Tech, actually. Uh, imagine how good we'd be if we could have hired people from Purdue, right? So, um, but you know, being in Atlanta, we've got a, a great, having a great engineering school in your backyard is a, such a blessing. Um, so yeah, a life full of blessings. I thank you for this, and, um, and I hope that we get a chance to, to give back as, uh, as we move forward. So, thank you. Ashish Gupta is one of our alumni who has a foot in the engineering world and also a foot in the business world. Since finishing his PhD at Purdue in 2004, he has worked at Intel, 
advancing to become Senior Director of Hardware Engineering in the Data, <coughs> excuse me, data Center and Artificial Intelligence Group. He leads an international team and helps to deliver hardware that supports tens of billions of dollars a year for numerous companies. He's also smart enough to hire from Purdue and often sends his engineers to our Dr. Weibel to study heat transfer and microchip cooling. He's an outstanding mechanical engineer, ladies and gentlemen, Ashish Gupta. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. I've uh, given talks in front of hundreds of people, but uh, the legends that are sitting in front of me, it's making me nervous, and I don't want to imagine all of you naked. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to continue. I mean, uh, uh, it takes a long journey to get here, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who are actually don't see, but who are behind me in getting me up to this position. Uh, when I was finishing my bachelor's, I wasn't really interested in, like, should I go for higher education? And my parents, they really pushed me, no, no, you should. And my dad actually even filled up the form for me, right? I just had to sign it up. And uh, so I started my master's. Then they had a, I had another amazing professor over there who said, no, you should go for PhD. Uh, go to Purdue. They have the best mechanical engineering department. I applied to Purdue. I wasn't sure I was going to get in. Luckily. We have Professor Gore over here who decided to trust me and took me in under his wings. I came to Purdue. I had a professor like Professor Viscanta and Jayati Murthy on my committee. Uh, amazing time. Uh, just like you know, the diamonds are formed under tremendous heat and pressure. That's that's how like how my life went uh, as I went through Purdue. Uh, and I had amazing uh, mentors also at Intel who keep on trusting me, giving me additional responsibilities. And I have had the privilege of taking all of the learnings and sharing it with the new mechanical engineers as they join the company, making them like, yeah, as the previous uh, OME awardee said, right? trusting them, asking them to do something great, wonderful, uh, go for their dreams. And uh, there's a quote that I like, right? You never get awarded for what you received. You get awards for what you give. So I've been trying to give, and I know the legends in this room have been giving for many, many years. So thank you so much, Professor Grohl, and the faculty for giving me this award. I'm forever in debt. Thank you. Our next recipient is one of our own, Bob Lucht the Ralph and Betty Bailey Distinguished Professor. Oh, right, yes, let's hear it for Bob. <clears throat> He's a rock star, that's for sure. Martha told me that he had long hair in his yearbook photo, so I have to go find that in the yearbook files. You, you've seen it? Okay. Okay, we'll do that at next year's awards. <laughs> So he is the Betty Bailey Distinguished Prof Ralph and Betty Bailey Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering here at Purdue, and also the director of the Maurice J. Zucro Laboratories. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of Zucro Labs, that's basically the place where rocket scientists are born. It's the largest academic propulsion lab in the world, and Bob oversees 24 acres of combustion, propulsion, and energetic materials. Zucro graduates. Des Zucco graduates design and build the rockets of SpaceX, Blue Origin, NASA, and many more. And Bob is the one who oversees all of this amazing research. And Bob himself is also an accomplished researcher developing laser-based combustion diagnostics. He's a fellow of ASME, AIAA, the Combustion Institute, the Optical Society of America, and probably a few more I forgot to mention. Ladies and gentlemen, our king of combustion, outstanding mechanical engineer, Robert Lucht. Well, I'm not quite sure what to say after that. Uh, so. 
Thank you for the introduction. I, I would uh, like to thank my wife, Martha, and uh, my daughter, Kimberly, and, and Heather. My daughters especially are always able to keep my ego in check. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to thank my mom and dad, who are no longer with us, for always encouraging my academic pursuits. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, there's a lot of luck involved in, in where we get to in, in life. And in uh, my junior year of uh, college, I was actually a bachelor in nuclear engineering. And so I took a class from, in thermodynamics, what's now ME300, at that time it was ME302, from uh, Norm Lorendo. And I really enjoyed the class, and I was really impressed by how organized he was, actually. And so uh, I ended up going to graduate school and working with Norm Lorendo. And, and there's another uh, person who will be coming um, later in the program who's a graduate student working with Norm Lorendo. And so I had great mentoring from Norm Lorendo and also from Don Sweeney. Uh, Norm is no longer with us, but uh, Don Sweeney uh, is, I think, just retired from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. So I had great mentoring. And, and then I went out to Sandia National Labs and worked with uh, Larry Ron and Roger Farrow out there and learned how to do CARS. Uh, CARS is coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering. So I started doing that in the early 1980s, and I've been doing that ever since. And, and so it, uh, it's been uh, great for my career. Uh, and looking back and thinking about how I've gotten to where I am, partly it's because I'm, I'm a terrible typist. And so when I was in high school, I was very interested in history. But uh, at the time, you know, you didn't have word processors. You had typewriters. And so the, the thought of typing papers and, and making a mistake, you know, like every fourth word and at, at a minimum uh, was pretty frightening. So then I, I came to Purdue and... And I, I thought about going into computer science, but at the time, uh, you had to type your computer programs on punch cards. And so I would, I would get to like column 60 and then make a mistake. So that was incredibly frustrating. So, so I, you know, I was really lucky in my career in that, in that as I was starting to work for Norm, we got one of the first neodymium YAG laser systems that was commercialized. And so very early in my career, uh, I was doing things that were only being done at, at UTRC at the time. And so, so I was just very, very lucky and, and uh, feel very blessed and very honored to be up here as an outstanding mechanical engineer. Thank you. Our next recipient came to Purdue while enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah. Bill Mosley got his BSME in 1980 and then served as a Navy nuclear engineering officer for a decade before embarking into the business world. He worked with Corning Incorporated, BP Solar, Tech Assist, and Volvo Trucks before going out on his own and forming Mosley Capital Investments, which has become a nine-figure business. He's an outstanding mechanical engineer, a tug-of-war fan, apparently, Ladies and gentlemen, William Mosley. Okay, well, being the good Purdue engineer, I wrote my remarks on engineering pad paper that I actually still had from 1980. <laughs> Scary thought. But Purdue taught me a lot of things. You know, we go back in time to vector loops, instant centers, Reynolds numbers, Prandtl numbers, and Sherwood numbers, and every other number known to fluid mechanics. We also learned about thermodynamics. We also learned how to put a pizza box on the pinnacle of Slater Center, <laughs> and how to hide things in plain sight. Luckily, my nephew, who's also my general counsel, is with me tonight, so he assures me his statute of limitations is over on this stuff. <laughs> but most importantly, Purdue taught me how to work with others. And I don't think I could have gotten through the experience without the collaboration of a group of us that worked together 
And that's why it does my heart really good to see all the spaces now that are dedicated for students to work together, to figure everything out, to leverage each other's talents, and move forward to get the degree. And I'd just like to formally recognize the people that were part of our study group. Jeff Getty, Bob Kushner, Bob Frederick, Tony Fleming, Dan Ritter, Dave Bourbon, and a TA that helped us immensely, Ben Mooring. So it takes a lot of people to get the degree and a lot of great instructors, and I appreciate every minute that I was able to get a degree from Purdue because it's the best place going. Thank you. Now, you may have read in the program that our next recipient has wanted to be a car crash engineer since the age of 10. Now, I was crashing matchbox cars at the age of 10, uh, but engineering had nothing to do with it. Uh, obviously, Becky Mueller was far more focused. She came to Purdue for a summer research program at Herrick Labs, and after an internship at General Motors, her dream came true as she eventually became a senior research engineer at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. The crash tests that she designs and oversees have helped to save thousands of lives on our roads every year. She is a well-deserved, outstanding mechanical engineer, and we're happy to honor her tonight, Becky Mueller. I was 10 years old when I saw the nighttime news and the very first IIHS car crash tests on TV, and I knew that was what I wanted to do. I could not have seen this dream come to fruition without Purdue University. My academic career at Purdue began with the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship and I was one of the first non-Purdue students to get the opportunity to participate. I worked at Herrick Lab with Dr. Grohl and Dr. Braun on compressor research. And that summer, they had a, their annual compressor conference where I made a connection with someone at General Motors who said, tell me where you want an internship in General Motors and I'll make it happen. And I told them vehicle safety and it was the foot in the, my foot in the door of the automotive safety community. I then went to Purdue for grad school, and it really set me apart from other candidates when I went to apply for my a dream job at IHS. It was great classes like vehicle dynamics taught by Dr. Starkey, and exceptional cutting edge research like working on personalized spinal implants for disc degeneration that were formative to my ability to be able to do this work. But it was the people that was outstanding. In a campus of more than 30,000 students, in mechanical engineering, I never felt like just a face in the crowd. Professors always had their doors open to give advice, to steer me in directions, and to be my cheerleader when I thought I couldn't do it. People like, Professor Krausgrill, Professor Rhodes, and Professor Bajaj were the kind of people that saw my potential when I couldn't even see it in myself. 12 years into being in my dream career, I sometimes wonder, what's the impact? What am I really doing here? And I had a colleague recently tell me that the work I do every day directly impacts vehicle designs, and those vehicle designs mean that someone who otherwise wouldn't have walked away from a crash does so. And that person is walking away from a crash today, in six months, in a year, in five years, and in 10 years. And I owe that to my education here at Purdue. 
I am forever grateful for this opportunity to be recognized for the work that I do and the positive impact that I can have on this world. So with that being said, forward to the next challenge and boiler up. Next up is Bill Partridge, a distinguished researcher at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. With more than 34 years of experience developing diagnostics for engines and combustion. In addition to his own research, he also has a strong relationship with industry, in particular collaborating with Cummins on their engine designs for more than 25 years. He's devoted to developing the next generation of engineers and researchers, and we're happy to honor him for that tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, an outstanding mechanical engineer, William Partridge. What a night. I'm happy to be here. I made notes too, because that's what engineers do, I think, or at least I do. So thank you to the mechanical engineering faculty and the department for this honor, and congratulations to all the other outstanding mechanical engineers. Um, I was at Purdue from 90 to 95, graduate school, working on my PhD with Norm Lorendo, and uh, Bob's been outstanding since at least that time, and I'm really share, happy to share that pedigree and tonight with you, Bob. Uh, that makes it a particular honor. But uh, I had the opportunity to come to Norm's group, and he needed somebody to develop this new capability, planar laser-induced fluorescence. And I got to do that, and then we applied it to measure nitric oxide formation, <coughs> formation in these special type of flame that had to do with NASA's supersonic transport. So the greatest thing that happened in that time was that the summer after passing my qualified exams in February of 91, Nancy and I got married. <laughs> she and the cat moved up from Mobile, Alabama, and we bought our first house. I'm really turned around, I don't know where it is, but up on Indian Trail Drive. So those were awesome golden years. So uh, thank you, Nancy, for, you left a really great job. He was making good money, but thank you for coming up here um, with me to Purdue. Graduate school's tough, and sometimes when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to appreciate the great things, because you just see the, the stress sometimes. <laughs> but time has really allowed me to appreciate that those were awesome golden years at, at Purdue in a way that it was hard to see at the time. Great in terms of academic research, networking opportunities, and particularly Norm. Norm and I didn't always see eye to eye, and we, we, we bristled, but in a way we were a perfect match because he, with him I was able to do this dream thing of developing and applying this PLIF imaging uh, capability. Um, there's something about imaging for me. I had developed a different Imaging diagnostic based on interferometry during my master's at University of Tennessee. I have an imaging diagnostics going on at uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab right now. Maybe I'll, maybe I'm a visual guy or something. But there's also something about being able to pitch some light into this space and see this invisible plume or temperature gradient or concentration distribution. And Norm allowed me to do that. Um, and that, that, that was special. He had a very well-funded research program. Uh, Bob pointed at this. I was able to get access to advanced materials, lasers, uh, optics, and really allowed me to focus on, on, on the research, and not so much about where am I going to get this mount, where am I going to get this. Norm uh, provided that support. I had the support to go to the top research conferences, the Gordon Conference, the Combustion Institute conferences, and there I, I presented. 
I was able to meet the, the top guys in the nation in combustion diagnostics, have, have beers with them, eat lunch with them, really get to know them. I still interact with these people. Ron's colleague, or uh, Norm's colleague, Ron Hansen out at Stanford, I still communicate with, with him and work with his graduate students. And then there were exceptional resources just at the university. Um, the departments, the other schools, things that are unique to top level universities like, like Purdue and, and, and like that you just won't get from smaller universities. Even just copying machines in, the, in, in, in 1990. Uh, Carol Wolf was, she was, I'm not sure what her title was, but um, she was a great advisor to, to me and I think all, the, probably all the, all the graduate students at, at Purdue. And probably if you look in the front page of all the dissertations during that time, you'll see the committees change, but Carol Wolf's name is probably, probably on there. She called me down, I know, uh, after my qualifying exams, I passed. Nobody ever asked me what I made. <laughs> on it, but uh, Carol Wolf is one of those resources at Purdue. And really with all these advantages, there were very few graduate students in the United States that could compete with me as long as I was sufficiently hardworking, smart, uh, creative. I was competing with the national labs and uh, it allowed, that allowed me and Norm and the broader team to just do some awesome, awesome research. And then there were outstanding opportunities in the classroom too. That's my research. Uh, you take classes in graduate school too. Norm was one of the top two teachers that I ever had. And uh, he really took pride in teaching. He loved his statistical thermodynamics class. And that was one of my favorite classes I, I ever had. Um, Professor Warren Stevenson, like Norm, his, his past, but I enjoyed many of his optics and laser classes. Professor Ramdas is across the engineering mall in physics, and he had this class where we would do classic optical experiments. There was a whole basement in the physics building that's a spectrometer. You walk inside, and we would put glass photographic plates and expose them, develop them, and then identify the, the unknown emitter. And uh, we, did, we made FTIR instruments. It was a, it was a neat class. Um, and then across the the little walkway from mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, I had a, a nonlinear optics class that I really, really enjoyed. So I was able to appreciate some of the unique things that ME had to offer, but also the other schools. And that's really one of the great things I think about Purdue. It's very well known for mechanical engineering, but they're doing great things across in chemical engineering. They're, they're very well known for, in chemistry. And it, for me, it was an indirect contact in chemistry that helped me get my postdoc at, at ORNL originally. So Purdue has this high level of performance really across, across the board. I mean, it comes down to, there's just fabulous opportunities at, at, at Purdue for research and growth. And beyond that, it's reputation and it's broad rec recognition. Even when we leave our school days, People say, oh, you're from Purdue? You, <laughs> let me give you an opportunity. And you gotta deliver, of course, and you can, but um, some of that comes from, from our pedigree, and I'm very you know, happy to have that pedigree as part of my professional development. And thanks again to uh, those who nominated me and uh, the broader ME faculty for, for this awesome award. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sarah Smith graduated from Purdue with her BSME in 2003 after completing a five-semester co-op with Procter & Gamble. She has spent much of her career with Halliburton in Houston, where she eventually served as Vice President for Health, Safety, and Environment, Service Quality, and Continuous Improvement. After getting her MBA, she then moved on to Amazon, and then she recently joined chemical company W.R. Grace. She is equally adept at supply chain issues as she is with motivating people. And that's one of the reasons she is an outstanding mechanical engineer. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Smith.
right. Good evening and thank you. I'm certainly humbled and, and honored to be acknowledged tonight, particularly with just the accomplishments of the fellow alumni tonight. It's pretty amazing to see what Purdue's been able to deliver in academia and out in the world uh, with just the group that's, that's here this evening. Thankful to share this evening with my parents who have had unlimited support of me in, in all of my endeavors. I appreciate uh, that continued support as well as well as friends who are like family that traveled up uh, and spent some time in Houston with me where we get to represent the Boilermakers down, down in Texas. There's a great community down there. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> um, I think for me, when I've been out in industry, I feel really proud when I get to say that I'm a Purdue, Purdue mechanical engineer, something that generates credibility immediately. And that's something that I'm really excited to be able to share. And a lot of people understand kind of the difficulty of the curriculum, the challenging classes that we go through. But for me, it was very much the environment that others have talked about tonight. I think operating with integrity, figuring out how you work well with others, kind of appreciating the diverse thoughts that come from all the students that, that are all over the world that join us in ME. And then also thinking about risks that you take, being comfortable with trying new things that may be out of your comfort zone. For me, those values at Purdue are the ones that gave me the confidence to kind of believe in my capabilities when I got out into the working world. And that also allowed me to feel confident to kind of take some new roles and big roles that maybe I wouldn't have felt comfortable with as well. So for to me, that's, that's really what Purdue was able to provide, was building that confidence and the capabilities on being somebody that can be a leader out into the industry. So really appreciate the acknowledgement tonight. Great to celebrate with fellow alumni. And thank you very much. Now, if you look in your program, uh, for every recipient, I tried to find an appropriate photo that reflected their career. And with Todd Summy, I had to use like four different photos, because he started out in aerospace, working for Bell Helicopter and Pratt and & Whitney, then he moved on to aluminum working at Alcoa and Novellus. And if you remember in 2015, those Ford F-150 commercials, they're advertising military-grade aluminum body, that's Todd. This year, Todd's got out on his own, forming his own executive consulting firm called Encendia. We're proud to have him back here at Purdue. Ladies and gentlemen, an outstanding mechanical engineer, Todd Summy. Good evening. So I'm not sure if that was uh, needed so many pictures because I have ADHD and I can't decide exactly where I'm going to focus. Or, uh, but it's, it has really been a great career. Um, and I, I first want to uh, say thank you to the School of Mechanical Engineering um, for this recognition. Uh, I am uh, very, very proud of this school uh, and of this community. Uh, and so to be recognized uh, with this. Uh, it is really humbling and, and uh, something I, I really uh, appreciate greatly. So thank you very much uh, for that. I also have to say, you know, thank you uh, to my family uh, for all the support throughout the years of ridiculous travel, ridiculous hours, and, you know, all the kinds of things that many of you also uh, experience. Uh, and without them, uh, it is impossible. Uh, to do, and so I'm very you know, glad that my wife Isabel, uh, my mom, uh, and one of my sons uh, could join me here tonight. So uh, thank you for for all you've done. Uh, and I, when I think about uh, my years uh, at uh, Purdue, is really where uh, I did start uh, building the passion, and it really sparked the passion around you know, design, uh, innovation, uh, and challenging paradigms uh, by working with. Uh, incredibly diverse uh, people with di diverse backgrounds and, and insights uh, and expertise you know, that exceeded you know, well beyond mine. Uh, and that's really how I built my career. Uh, and it's culminated in, in wh where I am today. Uh, and when I think about you know, the path forward, 
Uh, we really need to continue to innovate very, very boldly and, and challenge a lot of paradigms that we have today. And especially when I think about um, you know, sustainability uh, and equity throughout our society. Uh, these are really areas where great institutions like Purdue, like Purdue Engineering, you know, can and do you know, lead uh, in ma marvelous ways. And anything that you know, I and, and, uh, can do to help and support uh, in that uh, mission going forward, uh, I'm absolutely happy to do so. So with that, uh, again, thank you very much for this recognition. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Yoshimi Takeuchi plays a role in something near and dear to my heart, launching rockets into space. Since 1999, she has worked at the Aerospace Corporation, and as a senior project leader, she is essentially the Swiss Army knife of aerospace. When big launch providers have an issue with their spacecraft, whether it's mechanical, electrical, or structural, Yoshimi is the person they turn to. She's also an MBA, and today she's just as likely to be solving problems with human teams and project management. But there's no doubting she's an outstanding mechanical engineer. Ladies and gentlemen, Yoshimi Takauchi. I think we, all, we can all agree that it takes many friendly faces to bring us to where we are today. My story began when I was young. I struggled to learn how to speak. But my big break occurred when I was in sixth grade. There were six, two art teachers, there were friendly faces, that noticed that I, they observed that I wanted to communicate and, I, and my classmates wanted to hear what I had to say. So, but the skill just wasn't there. Then the art teachers had an idea. They suggested that I teach origami to my classmates, and I eagerly accepted the challenge. Over the year, during the process, I learned how to speak by teaching. People were amazed my grades went from C's and D's to A's and B's, and some said it happened overnight, but it didn't. It happened because two friendly faces, two art teachers, made all the difference. They reached out and shared their platform. There have been so many friendly faces in my life, including teachers, professors, mentors, and friends. So I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Purdue University, which had made a huge difference and propelled my future, to Professors Claude Cucchini, who believed in me when I did not believe in myself, Patricia Davis and Stuart Bolton for being friends, Eckhart Grohl, and all the ME professors who really stood by me. I really appreciate it. To my friends, Steve Kaufman, Fellow alumni, Brian LaFace, Daryl Miller, Freddie Navarro, Barb Jex Quarter, Jay Harris, and my mentors, Vinay Goyal, Michael Hirsch, Joe Estrada, and to the two young art teachers and to the many other friendly faces out there, thank you for making a difference to me. Thank you. Well, we've now reached the end of our program, and this is a very special part of the program for me. Earlier this year, Eckhart told me about one of our alumni, Eric Schwenker, <clears throat> who was 99 years old and still rode his motorcycle every day. And uh, 
In fact, when I talked to him on the phone, he was said he was planning to ride his motorcycle up from Evansville, Indiana, that's a four-hour drive, folks, to attend his 75th class reunion at Purdue. I told him, well, maybe it's better that I come to you. <laughs> and I don't think we should wait until homecoming. So in March, I drove down to Evansville and spent the day with him. Now I have to tell you, before I came to Purdue, I worked at a retirement community in Florida. And for 14 years, I interviewed hundreds of people who were part of the greatest generation. And let me tell you, I have never met a more together 99-year-old than Eric Schwenker. He remembered everything about his time at Purdue. He remembered hearing about Pearl Harbor when he was a freshman. He remembered every army base he trained at before heading to the front. And after returning to Purdue, he remembered every class he took and every professor. He still had his notebook from his senior year, and it was impeccable. I don't have my senior no notebook. He had his senior cords, which was a tradition from that era where seniors would decorate corduroy trousers with pictures of all their favorite things from their time at Purdue. And you can see in the program, uh, it has pictures of fencing on it, because that was his thing, was fencing. Not only did he still have them, he could still fit in them. <laughs> and he was thrilled to tell all his friends who hated him for it. And he still had his fencing equipment from Purdue and showed me some of his fencing moves. He did 100 push-ups a day. I had to tell him to stop. And then, just as advertised, he mounted up on his 250cc Honda motorcycle, and I filmed him cruising all around downtown Evansville. <clears throat> and then afterwards, he took me to lunch and told me he couldn't wait to get back to Purdue on his motorcycle and go cruising with President Mitch Daniels. Now, unfortunately, he never got to take that ride. He passed away just a month or two after I talked to him. It was a sad day. Uh, not only for Eric's family, but also for his Purdue family. Because we are all looking so forward to sharing Eric's story with everyone. But here's the twist. What I captured that day essentially preserved Eric's life story in amber. He may not be here in person, but now you get the chance to meet Eric the way I met him, riding his motorcycle doing 100 push-ups, not as a black and white photo in an old yearbook from 1947, but as a vibrant, multifaceted, amazing human being in living color. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you Eric Schwenker. When I was 82 years old, I bought my first motorcycle, 450cc Honda, nice little motorcycle. The freedom of it, the control of the machine, it's as close to riding a horse as you can get without being on a horse. My name is Eric Schwenker, and I live in Evansville, Indiana. My dad was a mechanical engineer, and he was also a veteran of World War I. And so I wanted to be a mechanical engineer and an artillery officer. In the fall of 1941, I entered Purdue. Purdue was a pretty good sized college at that time, had about 6,000 students. It was a good engineering school. September 41, I started school. In December of 41, on a Sunday morning, was the uh, radio broadcast from the President of the United States and we had been attacked at Pearl Harbor. And then I was tapped on the shoulder and put on a bus and trucked up to Camp Atterbury and commenced my life as a soldier. They said, okay, you're in the pack artillery. Everybody in the pack artillery walked and most everybody else pulled a mule. I thought, now that's not too swift. And so they said, do, do you guys want to go to the Owen Stanley Mountains in New Guinea and pull a mule? or do you want to transfer to the Corps of Engineers? 
And I asked them, I said, are the Corps of Engineers the guys that ride around in trucks? And they said, yes. And I said, yes. So I got out of the field artillery and transferred to the engineers. I didn't depart for overseas until the middle of March in 1945. And I went directly to France. We only had six weeks uh, in combat. Then we were sent to Frankfurt, Germany, which was the headquarters of all the U.S. forces. I spent four months there in occupation duty, essentially doing engineer construction work on, on roads and things like that, trying to make things uh, passable again. I had already decided that I was going to go into the Army Reserve and I was going to go back to Purdue uh, to get my degree. I knew what a degree from Purdue was going to do, but I was also able to get a job my first semester of my senior year as a drafting instructor in the industrial engineering department. So I went to school in the morning and taught drafting in the afternoon. And then since I had participated in the fencing program before the war started, uh, I went back over the field house and taught fencing. I wanted to go into heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning. Because that that's what my dad was in. I was still following dad. This is my notebook from my senior year. Various companies sent uh, personnel to Purdue to interview students. And International Harvester did that. And they had just started a refrigeration factory here in Evansville. And so I thought, well, I'm going off into a new direction now as a graduate engineer working for a company. I might as well do it in my hometown. When I went in the reserve, of course, you get paid for that. And that extra money was quite useful in raising a family. And I enjoy soldiering. I don't like getting shot at. That part, no, I do not like. The rest of it, I enjoy. So I thought I'd transfer out of the reserve into the guard because I thought they were more active in their soldiering. And so I went in there as the INR platoon leader, as a first lieutenant. I stayed then with the guard for uh, 18 years. I started them in 1950 and stayed with them until 1968. And I achieved the rank of colonel. And then in 1989, the existing commanding general of the Indiana Guard Reserve uh, had to retire for health reasons. And so the adjutant general selected me to replace him. And I was then promoted to major general. And I did that for four years until I got to be 70. Then I told the AG that I thought I should step aside and let the next guy in line take over because uh, 70, he said, you can have a job as long as you want. And I thank him very kindly, but I did uh, retire then. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. I used the, the information that I gained at, uh, uh, at Purdue uh, just uh, con continuously for 50 years, I guess. Technical stuff does progress and proceed and refine and get even better. Still, an awful lot of that is basic. And when you learn it, you use it all the time. That information is what you fall back on and, and they gave me as much as I gave them. If you could please stay standing because Eric's five daughters are here tonight. Could you wave every those Eric's five daughters? His daughter, Amy Walker, will be coming up to say a few words, so I'm thrilled now to announce for exceptional performance in both military and engineering careers and a lifetime of hard work, persistence, and positivity, 
Purdue University is proud to posthumously honor Eric Schwenker with the Outstanding Mechanical Engineer Award. Oh my, thank you so very much. And thank you to those of you before me who had notes, because I not only have notes, but I have written words. And you're going to be glad, because at the end of the page, I have to be quiet, because otherwise I'm quite the talker. So please bear with me as I read this, and understanding this is quite an emotional event for all of us. But on behalf of our dads, five daughters, Anne, Susie, Beth, Julie, and myself. Thank you so much for honoring him in this way. The notification letter came about two weeks after Dad passed, and when I called to let uh, the office know of his death, Dr. Grohl called back saying that they wished to present this to him posthumously. And while this is a tremendous honor for him, it also break, brought great comfort to my four sisters and I. Our dad was truly one of the greatest of the greatest generation. His love of country was apparent throughout his military career. He was so proud to serve his country in World War II and afterwards in both the Indiana National Guard and the Guard Reserve. And even after his retirement in 1992, Major General Schwenker remained active in the military community, often speaking to school groups and others about his military service. But he was also very, very proud of his time here at Purdue and the mechanical engineering degree he, he uh, received, he earned, which provided him with a long, successful, and very satisfying career. He proudly wore his Purdue ring literally every day of his life, except one time when he had to send it off to have the stone replaced, and notice I'm showing you all four of my fingers because of where I'm wearing it, but he also then, when he was in the hospital and his fingers swelled up, they literally had to grease his hand to get it off because he wore it all the time, because he was so proud of his time here at Purdue. Even though he sent four daughters to another Big Ten University down the road and over, and another one to a Big Ten University north in Michigan, and he cringed at every check that he had to write for tuition. <laughs> he was still a proud Boilermaker, always reminding us from whence he came and how he was paying for all of those tuitions at all those other schools. <laughs> and Dad was also a very humble man. He never talked about all the patents that he had and the impact that he had in the uh, refrigeration and air conditioning world. But he loved his career, he mentored many, and he actively participated in ASHRAE for 75 years. And so he would be so honored by this recognition from the university he loved so much. And my sisters and I are so grateful to you, Jared, for the information that you gleaned from our dad that we had no idea about. For example, that he is the only person to be a 75-year member of ASHRAE. So thank you so much for that. This. Uh, opportunity that we've had to, to learn even more about our dad. And I know many of you in the room are parents, and, and a few of you are even grandparents, and so you understand what it's like to have those button-popping moments when our kids do something great. My dad would readily admit that he had a few of those in raising five daughters along with our mom, Jane. But now we five daughters are truly thrilled to experience this button-popping moment for, our, for us in honor of our dad. Thank you, Dad, for being the outstanding person and role model that you were. And thank you, Purdue University, for providing us with the memory of this very, very special evening. Okay, it's um, now time to close the evening and I would like to thank or to offer one last round of applause to all of our 2022 Outstanding Mechanical Engineers.
Your inspiring stories are truly what kept us going all along, the staff, the faculty, and of course also the students. Uh, you set an example of what Purdue MEs are able to achieve, and you make us all uh, want to push even farther to achieve even more. Uh, I should have earlier in the program recognized a few people. We usually do that at the beginning, but I would like to mention that we have five uh, attendees uh, of our Mechanical Engineering Advisory Council uh, tonight, and I greatly appreciate their service to the school. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude our program. I wish you all a very safe travel home and continued success in everything that you do. Uh, boil up and help Purdue and good night.